Today's episode is brought to you by MetaMask Portfolio. You'll be hearing more about them later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. Very happy to welcome back to Forward Guidance, Nick Glinsman, macro investor, thinker, and founder of Malmgren Glinsman and Partners. Nick, welcome back. What's on your mind, my friend? First of all, thank you for having me back. First half of November, which started with that. The first thing that people really looked at was the QRE, quarterly refunding, or the deficit announcement, then the quarterly refunding announcement, and then non-farm payroll on the date of the CPI. We had an extraordinary rally in the treasury market, nearly 60 basis points in the 10 year, and that's a couple of weeks. Bonds and stocks have rallied like crazy to start off November, and that started on the back of a collapse. And I think that's not not too dramatic of a word in October in bond prices. And then quarterly refunding announcement, that was the Treasury telling, oh, we're not going to issue as many long-term bonds as the market market thought. And that's the the, the face of the rally. So yeah, what do, what do you think of this rally? There's a, there's a tug of war going, okay? Tug of war is clearly it got the Fed governors and members of the FOMC Got a little nervous with how how high yields have got. Um, to be honest with you, I'm not qu- quite sure why, given the data we'd had up until then. And the market started to jump on that. I think that the depth of the rally, the 60 basis points in 10 year, we use that as the benchmark, also illustrates how a liquid treasury market's become. You know, it was because the depth of the rally was not just huge by historical standards it was fast it was fast so you've got this tug of war and it's all, they were worried that financial conditions were getting too tight well they've now gone back to the sort of medium level that we've had all year if you go right back to the beginning of the year that period from the beginning of the year until the last fed hike they were still hiking rates and we only it strikes me that there's this tug of war because you know, if you look at today's price action, again, reiterating it's November the 20th, stock market's up again, bond market's flat up, actually. But the stock market also is an input into, for example, the Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index, which is the one I use. So conditions keep getting easier. And I find that worrying because even though the CPI came in lower than expected we've i'm not convinced that we're going down super core and core levels um are very sticky and that last what they call people call the last half mile going from upper three or four percent down to two percent that's the hardest work all the low-hanging fruit has been picked already i don't think the fed is in any any hurry whatsoever to cut rates and with this easing of financial conditions, that suggested that that, it, that will be stimulative to the economy. And anything that's stimulative to the economy will be stimulative to CPI. If you look at the freight slash tr- trucking market, actually that looks like it's bottomed somewhat. Indications to me, if you add in also the fact that you've had a deflationary situation in China, and the US still imports from China. I'm of the opinion, people will say, well, that will feed through to CPI. It it could well do, but the consumer's in in fine fettle. I'm not convinced that Goldilocks, soft landing, is what's gonna happen. I think the Fed will be content to just leave rates as they are, higher for longer. There's a confirmation bias in reaction to some Fed comments and also momentum in the market. The idea that they're gonna cut rates in March is is absolutely absurd, okay? And if they're gonna cut rates in March, I'll ask you this question, Jack. Let me reverse interview you here. Uh Oh, as as Morgan, Morgan, here's Morgan, he has guests on, the guests try to ask him a question. Exactly. It's my show, I ask the questions. (laughs) What would cause the Fed to cut rates in March? A huge spike in unemployment, a collapse in CPI. Or a bank failure. Yeah. Significance. Some, do we see that? We're not seeing that. No, but you, you, know, you, ne- 
you, you never see these things before, right? You don't, but trends. Yes, jobless claims has been trending up slowly. Still, these are still great figures for the economy. You still have sub 4% unemployment. To be honest with you, 4.5% unemployment is not bad for the economy. If you go back to pre-GFC, when, say 94, I think, it was 6, 6.5%. So, yeah, or after 94. This is why there's a confirmation bias or a recency bias. And in fact, as you said, you know, we're managing money now. And, and there was a desire to get people, oh, <laughs> here's an admission, older than the majority of the current generation of PMs and, and uh, traders that thinks in that fashion. Well, 3.9%, still great. So <clears throat> you never see an accident until it's happened, i.e. the proverbial black swan. But there's nothing that really indicates it. Now, my biggest worry, if there is an accident, and it's actually not good for bonds either, is what's going on in the Middle East? Before we, we get there, I just want to explain your argument, which is that you think CPI is uh, not going down enough and the economy is strong that the Federal Reserve won't cut rates. So the, the, right. the higher for longer narrative was at peak pitch probably a month ago. A lot, uh, The short end of the yield curve has, has rallied. So the market is pricing in a few more Fed cuts. There's a, what, a 35% chance that the, the market is signing that the Fed cuts in March. That seems a little high to me. Yeah, exactly. Even June is, is a crazy high number. The other thing you should bear in mind is over the last couple of weeks, you've got everything the bull case would want. Everything. World is never that perfect. Where we were prior to the QRA, we've taken a lot of that back. And where we were prior to the QRA, with 10 years touching 5%, well, we've taken all that back and more. So the conditions that got us up to 5% are back in place. The easing in financial conditions is so substantial that I, I saw some uh, recent data on the, on the bank balance sheet, which I sent out today, a uh, commercial bank's balance sheet. Loans are being made, with the exception of CNI. They're making loans, the banks. Commercial and industrial loans. Yeah. Exactly. A couple of weeks ago, we had the SLUs, right? Which said, no, they're not making loans. So everything's suddenly gone poof, like this. And my experience in the market and the history of the market suggests that you don't turn on a dime. Things take time. And also, I, I, one thing that I'm, I'm really keen on, and this is how I, I do the fundamental stuff with Harold. It's behavioral, behavioral economic analysis. What does one expect? And I think we're running into the holiday season. Consumers are going to be spending money. Right, but it's they always spend money a lot. So it's it's in comparison. They're not going to be comparing Q4 to Q2. They're comparing it to Q4 2022, 2021. Given where the equity market is, given where the housing market is, prices, I think people will feel, if you're lucky enough to have a house, uh, I think people will feel adequately encouraged to have a good holiday season. It's when there's pain there. Housing, just think of what's happened in China, the massive balance sheet destruction of the Chinese consumer. It's so pain there or pain on your equity portfolio. Well, where's the pain been? People, people are inclined to buy ETFs, index ETFs. Correct. So why is the Fed keeping rates at 5.5%? Why must that be a negative scenario? Why can't the Fed keeps it at 5.5%? Currently, the market thinks the Fed is going to cut. As the market realizes the Fed isn't going to cut, the short end goes up. Last year, the short end going up was horrific for dramatic word, but horrific for, for stocks. This year, stocks have risen alongside short end yield. So why can't we would be sitting here next year, interest rates at 5.5%, S&P 5,000. Why, why, why could not? It's entirely possible, which is why I always prefer trading the treasury market to the stock market. Somebody said to me once, the stock market lives in the nominal world, bond market lives in the real world, real being real interest rates. So 
there's my view on the economy. The economy should benefit from this significant easing. The easing, the, the move on the easing side has been the equivalent of 60 basis points on the 10 year in terms of how dramatic it's been and how fast it's been. But also supply is huge. Supply in the treasury market is still huge. Everybody got this sort of excited with quarterly refunding announcement, lower than expected 10 year, 30 year. Still increased. And you, we've got another two quarterly refunding announcements to come, both of which will have increases. And if, if we're right on our forecasting and anticipation, we believe that the fiscal deficit will not come down. And that, that is a contrarian view to the market because conventional wisdom is looking for fiscal start forward, fiscal boost. And we don't believe that's the case. Harold, my partner, is uh, somebody with direct experience in this. Historically, defense spending is massively underestimated. And the US has been making increasing commitments, not just in the Middle East, not just with regards to Ukraine, now Philippines, where there's five bases, three are upgraded, two new ones. These are big commitments being made all over the place, and they're very expensive. Moving a, a carrier fleet is extraordinarily expensive. You've got two in the middle in the Mediterranean now, and one by the Red Sea. So our view is, oh, and then by the way, we happen to have an election. Okay, so neither party will. Who do you think is going to win? And who does Harold think is going to win? Okay, at the moment you can't bet against Trump, given all the data, but it's very early on. I mean, these polls right now historically have always changed later on. Let, let us throw in a little curveball here. One is RFK is polling quite well. However, Manchin, if he goes to the No Labels Party, Manchin can really take or, or have a big impact on both sides of the, of the aisle, right? So then it becomes... Who loses more to Manchin? Could Manchin win? Because if you look at if as you look an at independent, the, as an well, if he goes to no labels, that they, they can get him into all fifty states on the ballot. Yeah. I don't think he's got. Well, that well, nobody thought Trump could win, but he ran as a Republican in yes. a, in with infrastructure. No, nobody, nobody thought Brexit would happen. That's true. Okay, so I think it's a very fluid situation in, in politics right now. The, the other on the Republican I'm, I'm not a, a gambling man, but I'd say I I bet more, it's more likely I think that the Fed cuts in March than that uh, Mansion wins the presidency. I would say much oh, I, much I, much I, more likely. I'd take that. I, yeah, I'm with you on that one. But the, these are curveballs. They would have a massive impact on the election. Yeah. Okay, which side will they impact more? Yeah. Now, other things that we're hearing, and this is through Harold's contacts, is we can suddenly be surprised with Biden suddenly pulling out, and then it's Newsom. Is, so, is, that, is that real? Well, the progressives in the Democratic Party are more than happy with Biden running again because they got everything they wanted. Okay, so there's no, there's no opposition from the progressives. Look, there will always be rumors. I mean, he's 81 today, yeah. which makes him older than Clinton, Obama, and Bush. I mean, that's extraordinary. And people, even the Democratic Party, are clearly worried about Kamala. So what if he's running and suddenly has to pull out? Does Kamala just step up? And it's clear that there's something, go something's going on with Newsom because he was at the White House recently. He was given the blessing to go to China. Something's clearly going on. Now, the one thing I've been told about is if something happened there, he would come to, more to the center. It wouldn't be California politics. It would be, you'd have to converge to the center more. I mean, there's so many imponderables. What if I, I, I read something today, I don't know whether it was Politico, that said that Trump may not actually be able to take the oath of office because he may be busy in courts. I mean, what sort of situation? In that it's illegal or that he'll, his schedule is busy, like he can't accept the GCAL? He can't. He, I think a court case would prevail over his taking the oath. But it's not as nearly as important as the most powerful person in the world being inaugurated. Surely, yes, but 
it, it's got to be the law, right? If you're expected in court because you're a defendant, you have to get a court. Think of jury service. You can't get out of jury service, can you? Oh, by the way, speaking of, I did go to the Sam Bakeman free trial. What a, what a wild I saw time. Your, I saw your videos. I mean, that must have been a crazy situation. So yeah, I woke up at like 3.30 in the morning. I got there at 4.30 and I was 19th in line and they let 21 people in, 21 journalists. So wow. if, if I had only gotten there at 5 a.m., I would have been too late. It is amazing. I mean, when you think of what crypto has gone through and it's... What are we now? 37, just under 37,700? It is amazing. It is amazing. I've always said it's a tradable asset. But would I have crypto instead of... Crypto is one of those assets where fundamentally you're looking at it as an alternative to gold. Even though it doesn't trade like that at all. But Even though it doesn't, but gold you buy because you can barter with it. Crypto yeah. you buy because you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, but if it's a trading asset, you only care what it does relative to other assets and other economic news. And also, I think gold and Bitcoin as call options that will never, like, if they have to be exercised, the world will be in a disastrous place. In a bad state, agrees. So, it's your emergency security. Yeah, like, make 2008 look like just two. Um, um, it would look like it would be. If we're going just pure financial markets, forget 2008. 2011, 2012, European sovereign debt crisis, and they don't solve it. That's what yeah. I'm going to say. But would that be inflationary? Because it wasn't then, right? Yeah, absolutely. It would be several countries in the situation of Weimar Republic. But why didn't you have inflation in 2011, 2012? It was all about fiscal, and they were able to impose. It, what was it? What would have been the right thing to do would have actually been allowed to have allowed Greece, even though Greece has done tremendously well, to have allowed Greece to exit on a holiday from the euro. That would have been the right thing to do. For Greece, it would have been the right thing. It probably would, would not have been the right thing for the euro. Because if one can exit, then some, the next one can exit and the markets will go after the next one. So but I, I think that's what your point on, on the disaster scenario. If they hadn't controlled that sovereign debt crisis, which was a doom loop. Remember, it would have taken all the bank, banks down in Europe as well. And that's exactly what we're talking about. So it would, that's the sort of crisis that crypto and gold would be, physical gold, not GLD, physical gold would be uh, appropriate for. The difference would be that you, the US could print the money to pay the debt. So higher interest expense is paid for with clipping the coins, printing money, as opposed to you have to impose that liability on something else as if you were just like a, a creditor. If a private citizen, private company goes bankrupt or they, that's real pain. But if you can print money, it's a- uh, Well, that's, that's the status of the reserve currency. Yeah. It's, it's the exorbitant privilege, but it's also applicable to- Say the UK, they can print the money as well. But in the US, the US can still print and there will be demand. And the dollar's having a bad time at the moment. But I think that's also, it's all linked to what we've been seeing going on with easing of financial conditions, the bond markets, so on and so forth. But I, I'm not convinced it's durable. I mean, if you think of the last, for want of 20 days then, November, the 20 days of November. I've just made, I made a note of what I was, what concerns me. You've had effectively 20 days of easing. That's going to offset the trends in the economy and growth and inflation was stalled at too high a level. Okay. Which means that the Fed has no incentive to cut rates rapidly without aforementioned stress in the markets that we gave a few lists of. Few, few ideas of what could, that sort of stress could be. So I just look at things right now, and people may say, let's see, we're at 442 on the 10 year. Wow. May, wow. I know. Wow. Right? And I think that, as well as the stock market, is, is probably priced with the best scenario in view, best outcome for this particular level of where we are. Because we're in a new normal of higher rates. Now, 
it was sparked by Janet's, Janet Yellen's decision to slow its growth. But it, that issuance is still huge. It's huge. There will be future increases in duration. And the net, one of the next two or both quarterly refunding announcements. And if, if she had one tomorrow, she'd probably give us a bit of a surprise and up we go in yields again. Also, what's not happening, which technically would, is reverse repo drawdown is not being transmitted to leveraging up private sector repo or bank balance sheets. Bank balance sheets, they're not, they're not buying assets at the moment. And you're sure you're adjusting for the fact that deposits are going down because people are moving to money market funds? Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I once a week, I, there's two reports I always look at, Fed's balance sheet and commercial bank balance sheets. Fed balance sheet update shows reserves on the rise, hence stock market, punchy, positive correlation with bank reserves. U.S. bank balance sheet data point to loans decline. CNI not private and household and small company. Where is the private sector leveraging up of repo in terms of like lending to hedge funds? Nowhere? It's not, no, because look at where we are, November 20th. Do you have the data or are you looking at it a black hole of saying, it's like, it's like dark matter. You... There's, I have enough people I can speak to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at this time of the year, you buy the major money and you don't want to trade anymore because you know what your bonus is going to be. If you haven't made your money, you're just trading in and out and not in size, okay? So there's very little incentive to leverage up your balance sheet for the rest of the year. So it's not, it's not in there. So, so how do you explain the huge rally in rate in bonds and stocks over the past 20 days? Is it, is it people were short and they're covering? Yeah. If you look at Goldman Sachs Prime Brokerage, they were, they were quite aggressively short, same with Morgan Stanley. There was, so the, the buying has been reversing those shorts more than just outright buying. In the bond markets, at these level, at the levels that we had at the beginning of November, there is an attraction. But to be honest with you, and I hate using it because I'm a bond market person, TLT, all the way down, it was being bought. Mm -hmm. All the way down, because you could look at the shares outstanding. Yep. Gone parabolic. It's the same in the cash market. All the way down, insurance companies and pension funds were buying. And I talked to several people who either cover pension funds and insurance companies, both in the US and the UK, or are in. And the conversation is, well, it's got value now. And I'm sitting there going, you were buying it a year ago and telling me it had value. Yeah, but you know, at least I'm index neutral yeah, but the index is terrible <laughs> yeah but you're but shouldn't, they should be buying as yields uh rise like as, as stocks go up and bonds go down so yields up which is what happened this year the value of stock goes up and the valuations yeah, of stocks are, are higher the valuation of bonds are lower so you should be reallocating on an institutional level i'm not recommending retail people yeah. do this but it's the portfolio rebalance what you see at the end of each month what well, they should have been buying is tip 10 year tips above 250 and yeah i mean that was a giveaway i had many people on this program say say so right how long does such buying last how long did you buy five percent okay buy 10 years at five percent you buy at 490 okay buy at 490 480 okay now at 442 442 and a half let's be accurate is it the same value I don't think so because the 10 year tips is at 213. That was above 250 at the beginning of you know, November 1st. So everything's, in terms of the bond market, it's priced to perfection. So is the equity market. Not if we have a recession, right? Correct. Correct. And you don't think we will? No, not that. I think the recession is late. Remember the monetary policy transmission. That, I've had this discussion with several people and it gets highlighted by, by some of our mutual friends. 75% of all loans in the US are fixed rate. So the monetary policy ch transmission gets, just goes to 25%. Hence the difference between the economic performance of the US and the economic performance of Europe 
which is flipped. 75% is floating rate. So actually, and this is where fundamentally you could have an interesting conversation, fundamentally, not in terms of flows. If that's the case, then the ECB should be expected to cut rates before the Fed. Today's interview is brought to you by MetaMask Portfolio, your one-stop shop to manage your crypto assets and access a range of web free services all in one place. Overseeing your crypto assets across different wallets and networks can be very complicated. MetaMask Portfolio solves this by giving you the reins to manage your crypto from a single decentralized application or DAP. Just connect to MetaMask Portfolio to get a bird's eye view of all your coins, tokens, and NFTs, and you can easily buy, sell, swap, bridge, and stake crypto assets at competitive rates right within the app from a vetted list of providers. No more jumping between dozens of sites and apps. MetaMask Portfolio lets you do more in Web3 your way, giving you secure and convenient access to a wide range of features and services all in one place. Manage your portfolio your way with MetaMask Portfolio. Click the link in the description of today's episode to get started. Thanks, let's get back to the interview. Now that would go against ECB tradition. They're usually the last to start acting. But if that was accurate, why is the euro above 109 today? Coming up to 109.50. It's, it's, you see where I'm saying there's, there's things going on in the marketplace that are, are pricing strange outcomes, pre, presu, presuming strange outcomes. And yes, our job is to try and get ahead of the herd position, not to be contrarian for contrarian's sake, but to position. And then when we see our, our thoughts start to cook, translate into profitable trades, then, then push the what, trade. What kind of strange outcomes? If, for example, if the ECB was as reactive as the Fed historically, and it's not, I mean, famous Jean-Claude Trichet raising rates and so on and so forth. But if, the ECB, if you had Draghi in rather than the guy, and you look at where the economy is going next year, and where it's already, uh, Germany's in real trouble with the constitutional court ruling. It says, well, that big chunk of money that you've got for fiscal to keep you below the zero bound, actually, that, that's not legally part of the... You can't hide it. You've got to bring it into the budget. So the budget is totally out of balance and contrary to some of their plans. It's called black zero. Is that they're going back to... In German, it's called Nuller Schwarz. Okay? Now... If that, if they can't fill that gap and use that money, and it has to, you've got a contractual fiscal situation. Germany's in real, I think Germany's already in real trouble, but will be in further trouble. I think Germany fundamentally is deindustrializing, and companies are moving out of Germany to countries that can secure the energy supplies, and also countries closer to their big markets. So we're seeing a lot of activity of German car parts manufacturers building plants in the US and in the South. So, so if that was a drug ECB, the minute he starts to see the economy crunching at, with inflation going down, Draghi would be aggressive on the cutting side. This is a Lagarde situation. People just don't know how much she can turn the MPC of the ECB into a dictatorship. The Fed is a dictatorship. The ECB is still on there. Sorry, what, what is the strange outcomes that's being priced? Like what you said the market is situated in a way that's priced in some strange outcomes. What are those outcomes? FX is is anticipating the Fed cutting before the ECB. If you think the euro has moved up, mm -hmm. how does that happen? Rate structure is adjusted. And we've got a 35% probability of a cut in March for the, for the Fed. So FX is adjusted. And also the market was long FX. Let's not take that away. But that's a strange outcome to see the euro is stronger than the US. Because even, even with the days that we had over the last two weeks, the US is still growing. Europe could be flat at best. So there's some strange stuff going on. I, my sense is once all these positions have been washed out of more speculative stuff, uh, things will surprise on the return back. Does that make sense? No. I think we go back into 455% 10-year yield tra trading range. 
Perhaps we can even go to 5.5%, depending on how much fiscal issuance is coming and how they do it. What about, and shorten doesn't move? Or, or the, obviously, the, the, what about the two-year? Oh, the two-year will, will. The two-year will rise because, but the, sh- the Fed funds rate won't move. It'll be a best the, the, Yeah, yeah. The, the, market, the two-year will price out the, the, the cuts that are currently priced in. Yeah. Exactly. And that will have an impact on the FX. Mm-hmm. So now we have another thing that is hovering in the background in FX, which is dollar yen and it's quite specific. But there's enough out there that can upset these markets and get rid of the recency bias and return us back to where we were before. Maybe not at the- Do you have a view, have you, have you in the dollar tactically or, or no? Your view is on bonds. Uh, my view is on bonds, but- yeah. it, And let's, just, let's not bear the lead here. You're bear, so you and I believe Harold were very bearish on bonds in early September and that congratulations on that. Further back actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on, that, yeah. on that great call. Bonds tanked into basically the first day of November, last day of October, and they, they've rallied extremely hard over the past 20 days. You remain bearish. So you were bearish and you remain a bear. Do, right? Do you realize oil, oil, what was down nearly 5% on Thursday? Oil has been tanking. Made it back, made most of it back on Friday and is up over 2% today. So there's that. That's a funky market. That's that's also that shouldn't be a positive for the bond market. And and that we've got concerns about what's going on in the Middle East. I mean, wait, wait, wait. Oil going down shouldn't be a positive. That should be a positive oil, for the bond oil market. Oil going up. Oil, oil going up. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. The only thing I would say about the Middle East is it is escalating. It's not being reported by the press. And I I was watching Israeli news the weekend. And I saw a couple of former senior military people saying, if Gaza wasn't happening, the activity on the northern border with Lebanon is enough to declare a state of war, because that's just been going up like this. And then you also have Houthis with the ship on the weekend. What, what's been happening? What's been happening? I'm behind. Catch me up. What's been happening on the Lebanon border and the, the ship? What's the daily exchange of missiles on the Lebanon border just keeps increasing. Now, currently, Israel retaliates for stuff that goes on. And thus on both sides. So I think it was 26 missiles yesterday. Okay. Israel also attacked Hezbollah base in Syria it was over the weekend. Then with the Houthis, it wasn't a ballistic missile fired in Israel's direction. They took they basically took a, a, a big oil tanker out, thinking it was Israeli owned. And it actually is British. I think it's British with a predominantly, it's run by Japanese, so it's predominantly Japanese crew, but there's Ukrainians, there's Bulgarians, but the one Israeli's there. So they've taken out this ship in the Red Sea, a rather large tanker. And what we're doing is we're very, I'm, this is, typically my nature, but with Harold, we're very focused on what the mainstream media is not reporting. And it's not reporting on all this escalation going on. I think he used to be second in command of the IDF. And he was just saying, this this level of activity on the Lebanese border without Gaza is enough to declare a state of war. It's, It's going that far, right? So you get the daily Malmgren Malmgren political take. There's a section in there, Middle East update, and that's always focused on what mainstream media is not covering. So the northern border, Iranian activity, U.S. response, Iranian proxy activity. So that's what we we just focus on that because everything else is is covered, over covered, and probably not covered well. But it's the stuff that we're not we're not reading. That's the important stuff. Because the more this occurs, potential more fracking. Can you position for that? Well, I have to say on Friday, we bought some deep out of the money calls uh, on, on Brent. Not that, actually, let's just say out of the money calls. So if Brent gets to a certain price yeah. above where we are. Oil. Long oil. Long oil. Oh, yeah. But in a, in a, a risk-controlled fashion. Yeah. Which seemed to make sense as a hedge. Okay. Especially with the Saudis likely to extend their cuts. 
But anyway, let's go back. Will has been, I mean, I haven't done the nerves myself, but I've read the work of people who have, people like Warren Pies. I'm, I'm sure you've observed it too. Oil has been a fantastic hedge. When oil rallies, the stock market goes down. Bonds, oil has crushed bonds as a hedge. Exactly. You've got to have, now, actually, it's a complementary trade. Back to the bond market, because I think you and I have had many conversations where I say everything is driven by the race market in the end. Stock market people may disagree. This year, it, it certainly isn't the case, but there's been some decent drawdowns in the stock market periodically when bonds have gone strange. So I am just going, there's another great big dark shadow that people must keep their eyes on. And we were talking about this at the beginning before we went on air, mm -hmm. and that's Japan. Japan. Now, I wrote a, a piece back on the, when did I do it? 14th, so last week. Ask you the question, the answer. What is the world's biggest carry trade? Borrowing in yen, buying everything else. Right. But the world's biggest carry trade itself, which is predicated on exactly that, is the Japanese government. Now, including inclu the definition of that for the purpose of this com conversation is Bank of Japan. Post Bank and GPIF, the pension funds. And there was a set, some Louis Fed and IMF paper, which, if you consolidate their balance sheet data from both those, the balance sheet of the job, the Japanese government consolidated balance sheet, it equates to 500% of Japanese GDP. In other words, $20 trillion. Okay, now why would that be the world's largest carry trade? Well, we know that on a smaller basis, Mrs. Watanabe buys foreign bonds and hedges them back into. Yeah, that doesn't work anymore. Yeah, so, so Nick, let's explain for the audience. So, yeah, a carry trade is when you basically you, you, buy, you, have, you, a, you, have, you have a position on where every day you're, you're making money. You're like the, the, the positions being long. Call options in oil and long puts on bonds. Those are not a positive carry. As I would say those are negative carry. Carry is, is just earning something. So if you borrow in a cheap currency, if you borrow at zero to buy a riskier thing that yields 10%, that, that's a, a carry trade. And then Mrs. Watanabe is like saying Mrs. Smith or Mr. Smith. And in America, a lot of people in the savers deploying in stocks and, and real estate in Japan, I hear they are quite into shorting their own currency. Well, that's it. Now... They're not on their own, of course, yeah. because the Bank of Japan has been buying foreign bonds. It's been buying foreign equities. GPIF, the pension funds, and the post. Sorry, what is that? GPIF is the biggest pension fund in the world. Okay. And the post bank, it's another uh, huge pension fund. There's also... Oh, Japanese pension fund. Interesting. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. They've also been buying foreign instruments, debt and equities. Think of all those, those three, as funded by yen, okay? They've been buying now, foreign denominated assets. Using, borrowing, effectively, make it simple, borrowing in cheap yen, a currency that has fallen enormously this year as well. Yeah. Because you always want to do a carry trade over the currency that looks weak. Yeah. That helps. Okay. Borrowing something that goes down in value is good because when you have to pay it yes. back, you have to pay back less. Exactly. So they, and as we all know, they've been, I mean, Bank of Japan has got a, a I think they've probably got the Magnificent Seven as part of their portfolio. So if you have a gross balance sheet value of around 500% of GDP or $20 trillion, it is in, in effect one big carry trade because you're financing it negative and you're investing in something positive, okay? So even if you're going out on the Japanese yield curve, it wasn't that positive, but it was still positive. There's a huge, huge carry trade. Why hasn't it blown up over the last few years? Or the last 20 years. Or the last 20 years. On the liability side, the Bank of Japan controls the government's cost of funding. Mm -hmm. And that's been kept at zero, occasionally negative. 
despite rate rising inflation. Hey everyone, we're about to get back in the action, but before we do, let me give you a lowdown on what's been brewing at Blockworks. Come March next year in the heart of London, we're bringing together hundreds of the world's heavyweight asset managers. I'm talking about the big hitters, fund managers, allocators, payment providers, and the major high frequency traders. They'll all be converging at Digital Asset Summit London, the mother of all digitally focused conferences in the institutional space. If you're curious about what the big money is up to in the digital asset scene, this is the event for you. We're diving deep into the intersection of macroeconomics and crypto, dissecting where we're at at the market cycle, and we'll be getting into the nitty gritty of real world assets. So think stable coins and on-chain treasuries, it's all in mix. I'm gonna be there and so are the forward guide superstars. Michael Howell is gonna be there. There's a rumor that Joseph Wang is gonna be there. I don't know who started that rumor, but people are saying that. We're also getting into the minds of allocators, so you get a front row seat to what the big crypto money managers are cooking up these days. And because you're a dedicated Forward Guidance listener, here's an exclusive treat. Use code FG20 to get 20% off. Just hit that link at the end of this episode, so gear up, because I'm looking forward to seeing you in sunny London town come March. Thanks, let's get back to the interview. The, the rising inflation has been a new phenomenon. For a while, Japan had deflation and was trying to fight deflation. Not only that, but the, the buyers of foreign assets, be it the Bank of Japan, Post Bank, the GPIF, have benefited from the depreciating yen. Mm -hmm. They're making a huge amount of money. I mean, I always say to people, if somebody's buying foreign equities, actually a gain or loss is dependent on the currency, not so much the equity market. It's usually the currency that makes it money or loses you the money. What will force this carry trade to unwind? And this is where it gets really interesting and people are not, this is why sometimes the markets get quite anxious ahead of a Bank of Japan meeting because it has follow through effect across the world. Sustained inflation, that's going to cause that carry trade to unwind. If the Bank of Japan has to hike rates, first of all, they've got to get rid of the Yoko control, which we're headed in that direction. But if they end up having to go from negative rates to positive rates because inflation is, is out of control, well, the yen is going to rally. And there's a massive carry trade that. And could that will screw possible. over everyone who's doing the carry trade who's a private market player, including the largest banks. I mean, not the Bank of Japan. Government. I mean, the Bank of Japan is not short the yen, they own quadrillions right. of yen. But long Post quarter. Bank and GPIF. Every time they go abroad to invest, they are effectively short the yen. But that's a, probably a small short against the net being long Japan, right? Big enough. Right. We're talking a twenty trillion balance sheet, right? Yeah, I but mean, they own they own so much. Well, the, think of this: you're talking the Bank of Japan's balance sheet is twenty trillion. No, the Japanese government balance sheet. Post Bank and the GPIF are government institutions as well. Okay. Okay. Think about this. Japanese investors own 9% of the French bond market. Japanese investors are very active in the Brazilian bond market. Reason being is the second largest, the largest expat community of Japanese in the world is in Brazil. So there's a lot of familiarity. Any unwind of size in the Brazilian real who would absolutely slaughter. That, that sounds like totally a bad situation for every private market player who is doing the carry trade. But you agree with me that, that don't like, Japanese investment funds and the Bank of Japan own a lot of yen denominated assets too. Which oh, yes, rally. absolutely. But yeah, yeah, yeah. They own enough foreign de denominated assets for this to matter because they are funded in yen. And if the yen starts to rally hard, so my, my advice is because at some point this is going to happen. Inflation came a little bit lower, but there seems to be a trend of higher inflation in Japan. Doesn't surprise you with the yen, yen's fall, imported costs are going to rapidly mm -hmm. rise. The cost of buying crude oil in yen, regardless of what happened to crude oil, or of the other commodities, food. So if the bank, we have to watch over the next nine months, maybe longer, what's happening to Japanese inflation? What is the Bank of Japan's reaction? And if the market starts to anticipate Bank of Japan, once your curve control is yeah. gone, coming away from negative interest rates and heavens forbid, for the positive interest rates coming through, well, the yen's got a lot of room to rally itself. And that 
at that point is where you will see foreign bond markets and the most owned foreign equities hit as people unwind, unwind that trade. Because as I said to you a couple of minutes ago, if you're an American, if you're an American investor investing in European equities, very often your PL is dependent on the foreign exchange if you're un unhedged. And that can go if equities rally, oftentimes it, it could be because the rates market is coming down in Europe. Euro coming down and you lose whatever you've gained on the equities. And I think that's also in the last two years, that's why the US market has been so heavily invested by foreigners. The dollar has been strong. Some, some would say the dollar is strong because of the investment. I would say the do dollar strengthened because of the investment flows. Now, if those flows reverse, the dollar could weaken in that respect. So, we have to watch this because it will permeate right right the way through the markets around the world. And obviously, I think that they're being careful, but this is another interesting aspect of today's price action. The yen rallied quite hard today. At one point, it was 1.2% stronger. It's now 0.9% stronger today, 148.33. Hasn't had any impact on the bond markets globally. But that's, a, that's something, if we suddenly go down to 140, would it? Probably would start to. And it would be a negative impact leading to higher yields. Because so, it's low. So so yield, curve, yield curve control probably going away, but that's on the long end of the yield curve. That could, I mean, this is mainstream belief at this point, cause the long end of the treasury market and other sovereign bond markets to sell off. Absolutely. And then people are going to come out and say, oh my God, the treasury market is cheap to Japanese investors, but if the short end is st is still at negative rates, the 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 like the hedging costs, are high. So you're saying not just the Bank of Japan is going to stop yield curve control, but they're going to raise rates. Well, the first process will be withdrawal of yield curve control, and we've been on that path this year, probably first quarter next year. The next stage is what are they going to do with interest rates, which are current negative interest rates taking them to zero, taking them slightly positive. So we have to watch that. What's the trigger? Japanese inflation. So we have to watch that, right? Because yeah. that, that sort of move will have a, a feed through. It'll be like the wave will just float through the rest of the markets. And it won't be a good wave. It won't be a positive wave. So it's interesting. And I'm sure the Japanese are aware of this. Bank of Japan is aware of this. But... Rather like the Fed have said to other countries like Argentina, it's your problem. We do our, our monetary policy for our benefit. The Japanese have to do the same. Bank of Japan has to do the same. So Infl Inflation in Japan is like a little over 3%. So it's yeah. not nowhere near where it is in the US or however, the, the UK. I don't know the Bank of Japan's tolerance for 3% inflation. I mean, they could say, hey, we've had low, inf not, not long-term de deflation, but we've had close to deflation, 0.5% inflation, which is in central bank terms, that's deflation. And we, we want to do a little bit of catch up. Flexible average inflation targeting, as the Federal Reserve referred to it in, in 2020. Not a, not a term you'll hear these days. No, exactly. I uh, wonder why. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't follow the Bank of Japan nearly as no, closely no, no, as you do you're, or many you're people. You're right. However, and, and the one thing that would stop them raising rates if inflation stopped, what they don't want is inflation to be out of control. They don't want it to be seen as, they don't want it to be seen to be too behind the curve. Okay? No. Could they stop real rates from rising? In practice, they could stay behind the curve. And again, I have long notes on this. And the benefit of that would be to erode the real value of government debts, higher inflation. Is beneficial if you're running a large debt mm -hmm. liability. The trouble with that is it would hurt the older generation savers. And we know that Japan's got an aging population. So that may not be politically acceptable, as may inflation. So anyway, my, my whole point on this is we have my view on what's going on in the US, and I think we're price perfection. And I'm, I have my doubts on perfection. I just, but in the background, over the next 
seven to 12 months, we have to keep a very close eye on Japan because that has global market implications and they may not be pleasant uh, and could be very unpleasant. We haven't seen, they've still been buying on a hedged currency basis or unhedged. Now, it, why would you buy on a hedged currency basis? Because it's negative, yeah. Uh, it's, it's also yielding less than the domestic market. But un unhedged, then they're not sitting on, what are they now sitting on? About 4% losses in the currency. And then levering it up by, with the carry trade and borrowing yen, is that, that's like a reverse hedge. You got it. So it's a, it's a very dangerous situation that we have to just keep an eye. We really have. Do you remember when Switzerland suddenly let the currency go? And several hedge funds got wiped out because they'd funded in Swiss franc. And I heard about it. I was, yeah. Right. It could be something like that. Although the, I think, I think we'll see if something's going on with the Bank of Japan before they do it. Because I think you'll see some Post Bank and the GBIF start to adjust. And you will hear, oh, there's Japanese flows, there's Japanese flows out, flows out, flows out. They're closing down some trades. That would, that would, to me, be a big red light signal. In summation, I think that the, the U.S. Treasury market is priced for perfection, and I don't believe perfection has reached yet. There's a lot more supply to come. I think the easing of financial conditions facilitates uh, the economy in a positive way, and that is not necessarily going to help bring inflation down along with the stock market continuing to rally, that's also a positive for the economy because the economy is rather financialized, okay? Next year, consensus has it that fiscal is going to be smaller, but we're in an election year. Tell me which party is going to cut spending, even though we've got this automatic cut, if it can ever be agreed, uh, if, the, if the continued resolution carries on uh, and they don't get an agreement, there's a shutdown, there's the automatic cuts and one percent. No, neither party is going to want to cut spending. We also have the view that the deficit from defense, fiscal from defense, is higher and much higher. Fiscal from the Inflation Reduction Act, even the CBO says it's running three times faster than what had, had been anticipated. So we don't think fiscal is gonna give us any room to breathe. And then we've got two more quarterly refunding announcements that will be aligned with fiscal that's flat to slightly higher. And we would expect one, if not both of those, to have a, a higher level of back end high longer duration coupon issuance than we, we got the last time. Finally, in, in terms of the American economy, don't forget Janet Yellen's building up $750 billion in the in her checking account at the Fed. Right? She's been seen to use it when necessary. And one can only anticipate in an election year she will use it where necessary. Okay, but she doesn't actually you when she you say use it it's like she's got a credit she's got a few credit cards they're all linked to the same account and yeah. she can choose which card to swipe but she does not charge how much money the US government spends she just chooses which card I agree but i'm talking about that's a fiscal boost that runs contrary to what the fed's trying to do remember you know one of the most bearish signs i saw for for the treasury market and the fed's outlook and i'm sure jay powell wasn't happy to see this, Biden standing with the auto workers in support of the high wage packet. Wages, by the way, are running at four to five percent. Yeah. Still too high. That that was a that's bearish interest rates. I mean, yeah. I re high high wage growth, high interest rates. What's wrong with that? I mean, I'd much rather have that than well, low you know, wage growth, low interest. You want to have high wage growth higher than inflation. Yes. That's what you want. So you want positive real wage growth. We're there this year. Last year was very negative for that. Agreed. So yeah. 
So if we put all that all together, and then in the background, we have to watch Japan next year. And it shouldn't be understated and it should, shouldn't be underplayed. It's, it's very important. <clears throat> but if, if we roll that together, we just think that the, the treasury market, say ten, using 10 years of benchmark, will return to the 455%. And with certain negative news for the bond market, which could be positive for the economy, there's no reason why we couldn't see us break the 5% and go for 5.5%. I have got no problem with that. Our original goal was 540. We, we said 475 and then 540. That's, that's where we are. We just have this, there's just, we have a conviction that people are always optimistic for fiscal deficit and it always dis disappoints by being bigger than expected. So you are bearish bonds. Do you have a view on the stock market? Do you have a, now that you're managing money again, do you have a trade on in the stock market? Question A. Question B, regardless of question A, do you have a view on it? A hunch. Okay. Don't have a trade on it. Okay. Always difficult to get. We, we, we got access to it last week. So you'd be bloody hell this thing's run. Like, oh, I should have been short trade. It's always hard to get, get these. I think if yields start to rise again at this time of the year in particular with lesser activity and less leverage in the system if yields follow the path that we think is going to happen then i think the stock market probably gets capped i don't see that much upside from here and we're currently at say 45.70 on the s p futures so I I don't see huge upside from here, which effectively de facto means that I see there's risk on the downside. But I don't see a collapse mm -hmm. right now. I think the economy needs to go hard landing for a collapse. And if the Fed keeps interest rates where they are, is there going to be a hard landing? Or do you think uh, you're in the no recession camp? Well, I... I I'm, to quote my old colleague that you've interviewed, Johnny, I'm a bit of a recession denier as well. Um, yes, the data is a bit weaker, but maybe I've got a confirmation bias. I, I'm used to recessions being things very different to what people are concerned about now. Uh, show me the evidence. I mean, maybe Q1 is going to be weaker, but then we get back into Q2, going into the summer. There is still a lot of money and liquidity sloshing around in the U.S. system. And I don't believe in soft landing. It's either, I, I think that's got a 20, as Larry Summer said, I actually agree with him, 25% chance for soft landing. So I think the Fed stays higher for longer. Will they raise rates again? Well, I think the bar for raising rates again is very high. But yeah. remember, remember this. This is key to understanding what the Fed are thinking and where the interest rate market should be. What is Jay Powell's biggest fear? His biggest fear is repeating the mistakes of the Arthur Burns Fed, cutting rates too early. Slight dip in economic activity, cut rates, and then we had every inflation come up down with it, and then you had all the preconditions that built up to Paul Volcker. His biggest fear I can confirm that I've heard it's been said. He's said it to people I know is the following and making the same mistakes as the Arthur Burns Fed. And if you look at what most of the other Fed FOMC members have been saying, I mean, remember Kashkari, for example, was a huge Uber dove. Mm -hmm. Now he's an Uber hawk. Right. There's, but I think that's because that's the message. We're not going to make the mistakes of the Alpha Burns Fed. So what we had this month in economic data there's nowhere near enough for what the Fed want to see to, to be in a position to cut. So that's why I think this discounting in the futures curve of Fed moves starting in March, 35%, and then June. I think that's crazy. And then I look at the, I look at data that beyond the published data, and I look at freight market and the trucking market, and they're, they're beginning to turn up. 
Well, that turning up tells you something. Um, so I think that's, if I was to give somebody the message right now, a couple of messages, don't be, believe in perfection. So I would fade the, the, the bond market rally and watch for the implications for the other markets. Next year, watch Japan very closely. Japan used to be boring. It used to be a widow maker of a market. Next year will be a little, a little bit livelier. I mean, Nomura just bought forward, end of year curve control, end of negative rates to next year, first half of the next year. And then the ultimate thing I would keep in my mind all the time is Jerome Powell does not want to make the same mistakes as the Arthur Burns Fed. And the Arthur Burns Fed cut rates too quickly with inflation still high, creating the economic conditions that brought Paul Volcker. Okay, and I think both, I think the Fed is prepared to be tight for too long. Okay? And I think that's, that's a message that people sometimes get lost in. You know, if we're seeing certain things, tracking is very important. It's telling you at the heartbeat of the economy. So freight, heartbeat of the economy, and it's, it's bottom and it's beginning to move up. So given the easing of financial conditions, the, the Fed made one huge mistake, it's transitory. Okay, mm -hmm. transitory, tra and they got behind the curve. I think on the rate cutting side, they'll just keep pushing higher for longer until something breaks or some data starts to really suggest there's something. But it's not higher for longer. It's high for longer. Because no high for longer. Yeah. Not correct. H4, H4L, I think, is the, the market terminology now. High for longer. And I, and I think he, Arthur Burns probably gives him nightmares. It may sound like a dramatic, but we know that that's his mantra. Don't and, but Nick, everything you're saying about Powell's nightmares of Arthur Burns, a month ago, two months ago, that was utter consensus. And since then, the market's been whacked around a bit, pricing in cuts. You just think that's wrong. You think two months ago the market was right, now it's wrong. The short, um, short end. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. I think the, the SERS market, start market is, is way too optimistic. We've been here before and proven wrong. I, I, I think I've seen first initial forecasts for non ton payroll do 30,000. Right? That won't, that problem, unless, no, I mean, I, I, I think that will, that will probably do it. I mean, it's, it's interesting. You can wait, 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 say that again. What, what about non-farm payroll? The first forecast I've seen is for 230,000. Okay. From one of the big banks. Um, but hasn't the consensus big bank estimate been downwardly re uh, revised or ro ro like they've missed to the downside? Oh, yeah. yeah. But there again, we've also had ma massive revisions to the upside. Last year, before, when we were booming. Yeah. Now we're yeah. having revisions to the downside, right? Yeah, but the participation rate is, is also going up. So that could, account True. For, that could account for some of that. And it could account, for, well, it did account for the, the move to 3.9 unemployment, which is something Claudia Salm said. Her rule isn't working right now because of the participation rate. So that was one of the two reasons. I think the other reason was people aren't firing. They're holding on to labor. So I, it strikes me that there's still a lot of doubt out there and there's a lot of presumption in the markets. Yeah. Well, Nick, thanks for talking, talking with me. Before I ask my final question, tell yeah. us a little bit about Malmgren Glinsman, the work you and Harold do and where people can find more about them. Okay, so we, we write two dailies. One is ahead of the herd, which is a macro summary of 24 hours prior to the final ink being written on the paper. So you, you get everything. Plus, it includes um, observations that, that will then incline certain people to trade, trade. The other paper we do on a daily basis is the Malmgren politics take because, well, how Malmgren is your ultimate insider. He still has policy influences visiting him, calling him. He's so experienced and knowledgeable. Why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they? So 
we we tend to work on both papers or we tend to work on the politics take together and what we're trying to do is fill the gap that main street media doesn't fill anymore and that's with analysis well-informed analysis so of that could be fiscal isn't coming down this is why and then that can transgress into the economic side then we we do we've got several consulting jobs and we're being pushed to do either a bi-weekly or a monthly paper every which is more transaction orientated so that that may be something new in, in in the week but we've got a, we've got several clients that interact with us what are you thinking what should we do why should we do it uh, all fair enough and say we're not we're not sure about what do you think about this because we're thinking about it but we're not convinced and then as i said to you earlier one of the clients has actually said we want you to run a a managed account on a lot we don't want to see you trading every day which I don't like to do anyway. We want you to establish positions, obviously within risk limits, obviously with capital preservation as a, a fundamental precondition. But we want you to put positions on that will have durability, will last for a while. With regard to treasuries, I'm, I'm okay leaning on it now because I see a limit. FX, commodities, and stocks, I'm happy to wait. Got it. So, so when you say you're sh- short bit bonds sure. earlier, that was like personal account, not not the cl- client yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we had clients that followed as well. Yeah. yeah. We don't give trading advice officially. Yep, yep, Those yep. were the consulting clients. We had when we did that paper on fiscal deficit, we had a yep. lot of conversations, right. and a couple of them became very convinced. And whether it's better lucky than clever, it worked, and it worked huge. Mm-hmm. So it did. Know, and in fact, funny enough, we've actually received phone calls from people I didn't know, but Harold has known for many years. We hear you got this right. We need to talk to you. Okay, that's fine. X amount of dollars per hour or whatever it is. It's um, a couple of, it's basically a couple of soldering wealth funds. Nice. Final, uh, final question for you, Nick. Yeah. China. China. China and U.S. relations. Are they improving? What do you think? What does Harold think? Harold believes that they are improving. Harold believes, and I believe, we've done a lot of work on China itself. She needed this meeting. It may appear that Biden wanted it more than she, she needed it. Okay. Hence the dinner with the CEOs as well. However, our view of this de-risking, it will continue. The process has already started. And it's the change of the espionage law that makes life for foreign companies and foreign executives so difficult in in China. So you could trade some of the Chinese ETFs. I would never put money in China again directly. Foreign direct investment has collapsed, which is interesting because a lot of... That tells you how badly foreign companies have, have fared in the last year, year and a half COVID period. They haven't made the profits because that... I've always been convinced that the foreign direct investment in China is represented significantly by foreign retained companies retained earnings, mm-hmm. right? So I think they're trying to they're trying to sort out the real estate market. There's still twenty percent of the economy. That is a huge bubble that burst, and that's going to take a long, long time to rectify. Vis a vis the Chinese consumer, they're in a bad sheet recession. And in fact, it was she, and it, I think this was reported in, in the magazine for she remarks, Kyushi, um, who said, I don't want, we, we can't give helicopter money to the Chinese consumer because they'll save it, which makes sense if you've got bad sheet repair going. Um, so, I'm not. I'm not that optimistic on China. It'll it'll muddle along. It is following the path of Japanification, and we saw how long it took. It's taking Japan to come out of that situation. It's a typical mid- middle income story, basically. Mm-hmm. Yes, but yeah, it's interesting. Well, 
Nick, we'll uh, leave it there. Thanks so much for uh, coming on. Good to speak to you. Uh, People can find you uh, on Twitter at nglinsman. Thanks again, and thanks everyone for watching. Thanks, Jack. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at BlockWorks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined.